saying, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. I am willing. Be healed. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. What you say flows from what is in your heart. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Bless those who curse you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Your sins are forgiven. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, we are starting a brand new sermon series today, so I'm glad that you're all here. We'll talk a little bit more about that series in just a bit. Um, but I want to give you a little um, kind of insight of where we're going as church together. You know, about a month ago, we got into the car, we got all the girls into the car, which is a, a feat in and of itself. You're getting all the jackets and all the, the gear and, 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 and then the complaining that goes along with it. Anybody else in that? Or we're just doing that bad of a job? Okay, that's fine. And, uh, okay, thank you. Praise God. Let's get coffee. Um, and we got them all in the car, and, and we're, we're headed actually to pick up our Christmas tree. And then finally, from the way back, one of my daughters said, hey, where are we going? In all of this, we forgot to tell them where we were going. Um, and somehow they still got in the car, which is amazing. I know the teenage years are coming, and that won't be as, as simple, but they still got in the car without knowing where they're going. And I, th I was thinking about that, and I thought, man, I would hate that to be us as church. Uh, like, for us to be saying, hey, where are we going? We're, we all came here, where are we going? So I want to answer that question of, of where we're going. You know, about four years ago, we put this vision forward that was, it's this vision statement, to ignite a passion for Jesus in Connecticut, New England, and around the world. That's what we're all about. We want to ignite a passion for Jesus. Jesus is the one who's, who's changed our life, transformed our life. And we want that passion to grow within us as a church, but we also want to see that, that passion instilled in, in other people too as they give their life to Jesus. Over these last three years, we've had a theme for every year. This is actually the fourth year that we're in right now. You might remember if you were a part of the church three and a half years ago, the theme was Ignite Prayer and Worship. We spent the whole year focusing on what it looks like to be people of prayer, people who really worship the Lord. This is where we started what's called the first 20. And we've challenged the church, we continue to do so, to spend the first 20 minutes of your day with Jesus. We believe that if you start your day with Jesus, throughout the day, he's gonna show up, you're gonna, you're gonna really be following him at, at a greater way if you start early in the morning with him. The second year was a year called Ignite Faith. This is a year where we spent the year focusing on the disciplines of faith, you know, that's really what you do to grow a church. You focus on things like fasting and forgiveness because people love hearing about those things, these challenging things, but they're things that grow us in our faith, aren't they? And so we really committed to, to growing strong in our relationship with Jesus. In that year, we challenged each and every one of us to start a crew. That's three to five people that you walk with on a regular basis. You get together with them. You have coffee, like we're going to have coffee soon, apparently. And you speak to one another. You share life together. You pray together. You read scripture together. You might even have somebody in your life who mentors you, and then you mentor others as well. It's our crew. The next year, last year, we focused on Ignite Witness. And this year, we really talked about what it means to share Jesus with others, this is part of being a Christian. We're not hoarders. We don't hoard our faith. We give our faith. We want people to know about this Jesus. So we share Jesus. And so we learned how to pray, to live, to speak through that year. This year, as we started it, when I talk about years, I'm talking about September to August, kind of our school calendar. Uh, we're, we're concentrating on the theme, Ignite Compassion. We're learning what it means to be a more compassionate people. You know, our hope has been that we would ignite compassion so that the world would experience the tangible love and hope of Jesus Christ. And at the very beginning of the year, we even gave compassion a definition that we've been working with through this year. 
And that is this, is that compassion is entering the suffering of others ready to help. I love that second part there. Compassion's not just about a feeling, although it is. We, we want our hearts to be broken for what breaks the Father's heart. But it's also action. It's, it's in a position and a posture where we're ready to help. You might remember that we talked very early on about the prodigal son, which is really a story about the loving father. And in that story, the prodigal son runs away from the father and his family. But when he returns, the father, his, his heart is moved in compassion as he sees his son approaching. But then what he does is he runs out to the son and greets him, hugs him, kisses him, welcomes him back home. This is the compassionate life, where our heart breaks for what breaks the father's heart, but then we run out to the issue, run out to the person, run out to the problem, run out to whatever it is in order to be the hands and feet of Jesus there. Our goal this year is to learn what it is to be neighbor, as Jesus calls us to be neighbor. Our goal is to deepen our passion for people. I want a deeper passion for people. So how have we been going about this year? We've been saying a prayer, and it's a fourfold prayer. It goes like this, Lord, transform our hearts. Lord, give us your eyes. Lord, open our ears. And Lord, empower our hands. In the first part of this year, we focused on, Lord, transform our hearts. We knew that a life of compassion meant adopting the heart of God. We want the heart of God within us so that our hearts break for what breaks his. Now today, this day, right now, we enter into the second part of the prayer, which is, Lord, give us your eyes. You see, friends, we're going to be praying that the Lord would help us, uh, teach us uh, how to see people the way that he sees them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? How many of you see everybody the way God sees them? Yeah, keep your hands down. (laughs) I want to be a person who sees people in the way that God sees them. What is God doing in their life? What, what is the potential that they have for the kingdom? Not how have they hurt me or what they said or these kind of things, but what does God want to do in their life? What, how is he moving? And not only that, but, but we want to gain a, a heavenly vision, a heavenly sight for, for what God is, is doing in our lives. You see, we believe that God is alive, very much alive. Jesus, he rose from the dead and he gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. So the presence of God is is with us. And I don't know about you, but I want to be able to have the sight to be able to see how God is, is moving in the room right now. God, what are you doing? What are you up to? I want to be able to go into our workplaces, into our schools, into our homes and be able to see how God is wanting to move, how God is moving right now. You see, God is an active God and he's looking for us to partner in his activity, in his work. And so we want this kind of sight. I I want the sight of Peter and John as they were walking to the synagogue and they'd maybe seen this man several times, but for some reason they they had the, the divine eyesight to know that on this day at the beautiful gate, this man would be healed. And so they paused and they stopped and they said, in the name of the Jesus, in the name of Jesus, stand to your feet. And the man stood to his feet, began leaping into the synagogue. I want that kind of eyesight to see that that God is is on the move. I want the kind of eyesight that David had on that day where, for some reason, against all probability, just in his heart of hearts, he knew, today's a day where I'm going to defeat the giant. I want that kind of sight. I want the kind of sight that Caleb had when he went into the promised land and he returned. Everybody else, pretty much everybody else besides one, was like, there's no way we can get this. The giants in the land, but, but Caleb came back and he had this heavenly perspective, this, this visual, this, this sight to be able to say, oh no, yeah, there are a lot of obstacles, but, but God is on our side. We can take the land. I want this kind of sight wherever I go. And, and so we're, we're going to focus on that in these months ahead to really adopt that kind of sight. So, so, so where do we go from here? How do we adopt that 2020 vision? How do we adopt that, 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 that eyesight, that, that sight of, of God, of, of the activity of God? How, how do we do that? You know, um, you might know that, that I play the guitar. And if you're a professional guitar player, you've probably seen me play the guitar. And you're thinking to yourself, he does not play the guitar correctly. And you would be correct. Here's why. 
I learned my first five chords from my mom. And uh, my mom, who will be in the second service, and I will say it to her face, friends. I will say it to her face, okay? But she didn't know how to play those five chords. But she taught me what she knew. God bless her soul. Thank you. And then I went to college, and I, I had a friend who had a guitar and a guitar book. And we kind of tried to learn together, but, but we, we never sat with a professional. And so if you watch me play the guitar, if you know how to play the guitar, you'll see all the different things that I do, chord structures and stuff. They're all incorrect. None of them are the proper way of playing. I'm even seeing some of you in the room right now shaking your head. It's true. I can do a little something, but it's not correct. Why isn't it correct? Because I never went to the right source. I should have gone to a professional to learn how to play. Listen, if you want to know how, how to dance ballet, don't go to a karate instructor. If you want to learn karate, don't go to the ballet instructor. Go to the right source. So how do we gain sight into what God is doing? How, how, do, we, how do we gain visual into the things of the kingdom? We go to the right source. We turn to Jesus. And so that's what we're going to do exactly over these next four months, is we're going to turn to Jesus. You know, at the beginning of this year, I, I thought to myself, you know, this year for me, maybe you, you want to adopt this as well, I'm not going to really concentrate on fixing myself this year. What I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on fixing my eyes on Jesus. That's what this year is going to be all about for me. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who can change and transform us. And so that's what we're going to do over the next four months. We're, we're going to concentrate around the person of Jesus. And when you turn your Bibles open to the New Testament, for many of your, your Bibles, there are red letters in there. And the red letters are the words of Jesus. And so this sermon series is called Red Letters. We're going to go through the Gospel of Luke and look at the words of Jesus and ask God to teach us what it means to see the way that he sees. We're going to ask God to teach us how to see his activity in our world so that we can join him and see heaven come to earth. And so today we start this series off, and I'm entitling this sermon. I don't always give my sermons titles, but I want to give this one a title. The title of this sermon is, This is Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, these are some of the first words of Jesus. They're not the first, but they're some of the first words of Jesus. Jesus finds himself in his hometown. He enters the synagogue. Someone hands him the scroll of Isaiah. He then chooses the passage to share. And he shares a passage that is actually a, a word from the prophet Isaiah hundreds of years earlier. But there's context to this. And in, this, in these words, we discover who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. And so that's why I've entitled this message, This is Jesus. My hope is that at the very beginning of this series, we would have a moment, and this is the moment. I was praying that we would have a moment where we would just commit to Jesus, commit to fixing our eyes on Jesus. But to do that, we first need to learn who he is and why he came. And so Luke chapter 4 teaches us that. Let me give you some context to this passage because there's a lot of context. There's a lot of history to this passage in Luke chapter 4. As I said, Jesus walks into his hometown, comes to the synagogue, handed the scroll. He reads from Isaiah, which is Isaiah 61. But let me give you some history from, of that passage. This is not the first time that these words were spoken. As I said, hundreds of years, between 400 and 500 years earlier, these words were given to the people of Israel. Why were they given to the people of Israel? Well, that takes a longer story. Let me try to do it in the, in the most concise way that I, I know how. It starts with King David, who was the first king of Israel. He had a son. His name was Solomon. After Solomon's death in 931 B.C., the kingdom of Israel split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom remained Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. Both of these kingdoms would be overtaken at different periods of time. The northern kingdom, called Israel, was overtaken by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., Later on, the kingdom of Judah would be overtaken as well, and, and all the people would be taken into exile. The year was about 605 when Judah was overtaken by the Babylonians. 
Now, in 605, they were taken into captivity, but it happened in three phases, starting in 605 and ending in about 586. At this point, all of the people from Jerusalem, that's in Judah, that's their home city, Jerusalem, were taken in captivity by the Babylonians. They were in captivity for over 50 years, some of them for over 70 years, until uh, king of Persia, whose name was Cyrus, overtook the Babylonians and freed the people of Judah to go back to Jerusalem. This happened in three phases as well, interestingly enough, starting in 539 BC under the leadership of Zerubbabel, and then the second phase under the leadership of Ezra, maybe you've read his book, and then the third phase under the leadership of Nehemiah. Now all the people are back, but they come back into Jerusalem to a destroyed city. I want you to imagine coming out of exile, out of captivity. Maybe you've got this great hope, but you arrive at the doorstep of your city, which you cherish, which the Lord has given you. This is the place where God is residing, and it's destroyed. I would imagine that we would be a people standing there without much hope at all. But it's into this context that the Lord gives a word to his prophet. A prophet is simply a person who the Lord uses to speak his words, to be his mouthpiece. And so imagine standing at the doorstep of your destroyed city and hearing these words from the prophet. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. Imagine standing at the doorstep of your destroyed city, hearing these words of hope. These are words of hope. Wow, there's somebody who's coming that's gonna restore all things. There's somebody who's coming that's gonna take us out of this position of mourning. There, there's somebody coming, and I would imagine in that moment that they were thinking, could he come today? Could he come today? Could this person be delivered now? But the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, would hold on to this word for hundreds of years. Some of them thought that this was a word about their city, that their city would be repaired. But actually, this was a word that spoke to something so much bigger than that. That actually what the Lord was saying is there's hope, there's a future, there is restoration coming, but it's not just for your city. Actually, I'm going to repair what was originally broken back in the garden. What was broken was fellowship with the Father, perfect presence with the Father. That's what I'm looking to repair, not just a city, but a relationship with the Lord. And so the people of Israel would hold on to this word for hundreds of years. In fact, uh, years after this word was given, there's a period of time where the Lord was silent for over 400 years. It was like, almost like God was on mute for 400 years. But then God breaks his silence. God breaks his silence in 3 B.C., an angel of the Lord comes and, and gives a word to Zechariah about a son that would be born. His name would be John. An angel of the Lord comes to Joseph, comes to Mary, and, and announces that a son would be born. His name would be Jesus, the God who saves. People will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. Jesus is born. An angel announces it to the shepherds. A whole heavenly host filled of angels comes and sing glory, glory to the highest. This king has come. Jesus is born. He's raised by Mary and Joseph in AD 27. He comes to John the Baptist and he's baptized. Upon his baptism, he goes under the water. He comes out of the water. And upon coming out of the water, God breaks his silence. And he says, this is my son. In him, I am well pleased. That's not the only thing that happened. The spirit of the Lord rests upon Jesus in the form of a dove. It's almost like God's anointing him in that moment. Does this sound familiar at all? Does this sound familiar at all? The sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. 
Jesus, after his baptism, goes into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted by the evil one. He overcomes those temptations, of course. And then in Luke chapter 4, we find Jesus marching into his hometown. He goes into the synagogue. Somebody hands him a scroll, the scroll of Isaiah. He could choose any passage to read. It's a pretty big book. And he chooses this one. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now listen, after he read that, there probably there was a, a moment where people were like, okay, okay, teach us about this. We know this word, Jesus. We've been holding on to this word for hundreds of years Teach us, do you have any insight into this passage? When is it going to be fulfilled? When does it come? And then Jesus says this, which is so amazing. The scripture you just have heard has been fulfilled this very day. Man, this, this one you've been waiting for, this one you've been hoping for, this one that's been promised, who will deliver the people, who will bring captives out of captivity, who will bring sight to the blind, who will usher in this new kingdom, the favor of the Lord, is here right now. These are amazing words to usher in the ministry of Jesus, the fulfillment of this prophetic word. Why, why are these red letter words so important? I wanna share why, why these red letter words are so important and a great place for us to start this series. The first reason I think these, these words are so important is because these red letter words reveal the heart of God. This is the heart of God. This is the God who we serve. He's a God who has always wanted to restore and renew, reclaim his people. This is our God. He, he wants to bring restoration. He wants to redeem all things. And this word that was given is, was about the brokenness that, that happened in the garden between between humanity and a, a holy God. And now the Lord is saying, no, I've, I've always wanted to, to restore this brokenness, to, to correct this, and, and I'm fulfilling it today in my son, Jesus Christ. And, and this re reveals the heart of God. I love the fact here that there's something happening in between the words. There's something that's happening here that, that declares the heart of God, and it's, it's not even the words of Jesus here. It's in his very presence that he's giving the words, that God came as one of us to deliver these words. You know, there are a lot of ways that we communicate today. If it's somebody's birthday, you can choose to, you know, send them a text. Hey, happy birthday. You, know, you can do it through Facebook. You can even buy a card now that's a belated birthday card, which I think is so sad. It's just like, are we really that lazy and pathetic people? Like, stop buying those cards, all right? Just... Either send it on time or don't send it at all, okay? It's just a little opinion I have, I guess. I didn't know I had it till right now. Just conviction <laughs> that came over me. I don't know if it's godly or not, but there it is, right? Or, or you can communicate that message, message by showing up. I want to ask you, which, ways of, of those which way of communicating has the most impact? Showing up. You know, if your loved one wrote to you on Christmas, that'd be really nice. But what if they showed up on the doorstep? It has that much more impact, doesn't it? Wow, they, they, they came to, to demonstrate their love, to, to share this, this moment with me. And what I want to say to you, friends, is, is in this moment, Jesus, God in Jesus shows up. He doesn't send a messenger this time. He doesn't send an angel. He doesn't send one of his ambassadors he says, listen, no, this, this message is so important and my commitment to you is so high that I'm going to show up to declare it. It kind of reminds me of the prodigal son. Now, the prodigal son's coming home and, and the father, he doesn't wait for the prodigal son to get to his door. No, the, the, the father runs to the son. And this is what's happening here is God, he ran to us. Man, he, he ran to us in our need and our desperation. He, he ran to us as, as, as captives, as, as prisoners, and he declared in that moment, listen, I'm here. I am here. The, the God of the universe has come to proclaim that captives will be set free, that the blind will see. 
The second reason I believe these, these words are so important is because these words, they, they, they reflect the mission of Jesus. These words are the mission of Jesus. They're, they're precise. Uh, they, they share the purpose for why Jesus came. And it's an impressive mission statement, isn't it? You know, if you go to a job interview, you, you'll probably be asked this question. Hey, if you're given this position, what would you hope to accomplish? So you might answer the question by saying, well, I would, I would hope to increase revenue. You know, I'd hope to bring a, a work culture that would um, be one where people would be excited to, to work. I would I'd hope to bring a work environment that would create space for innovation and, um, you know, some other nice statements like that. I'm not going to give you all the answers right now, okay? Come up with your own answers for that question, right? But I want you now to imagine you interviewing somebody and asking that question, hey, you know, if you got this position what would you hope to accomplish? And now I, I want you to imagine that person looking you, you know, looking you right in the eyes, uh, looking right back at you and saying this, I'm going to bring good news to the poor. I'm going to release the captives. I'm going to bring sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed. There's going to be no more reason to worry because in me, I'm proclaiming right now, the Lord's favor. <laughs> I think you've but, I wasn't expecting that answer for this job. That's, that's amazing. Now, now, what would be even more amazing is this. If that person who said that went out and did exactly what they said. Friends, this is, this is what Jesus has done. And when he walks into that synagogue and he, he pulls down that scroll and he begins to read, he's declaring his mission statement. Saying, this is what I've come to do. I've come to restore the presence of God in people's life. How am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to release the captives. I'm going to bring sight to the blind. I'm going to bring good news to the poor. I'm going to announce and proclaim that the, the time of the Lord's favor is now. And, and then what makes this so impressive is that Jesus leaves that synagogue and he begins to do that. He brings good news to the poor. To the poor in spirit. To those who are bankrupt spiritually, which was everybody. Everybody is in need of a savior. Everybody is in need of God coming and making a way for us to have fellowship with him. And I think of stories of, of Jesus going to the woman at the well, who, who's now on, on her fifth man, and maybe feeling like she has no reason to be in the presence of God. Yet Jesus proclaims to her and tells her, no, the kingdom of God is for you. I want you to drink from this well. You, you will thirst no more. I think of people like Zacchaeus, who was, who was rich in, in finance, but was spiritually empty. And Jesus meets with him in his home, and, he, and Zacchaeus comes out of that home a completely changed man, spiritually filled, every one of his needs met. Jesus fulfilled this mission while on earth. He, he released the captives I, I think about how Jesus, he, he crosses the lake and he gets to the other side of the lake and, and there on the other side of the lake is this man who's filled with demons. So much so that they call them legion. And he casts the demons out. He, he released the captives. I think about how, how Jesus, he brought sight to the blind and in a physical sense he did that. We think of stories like Bartimaeus who called from the crowd. Many of the people said, hey, stop, stop it. Don't bother Jesus. But Jesus called him forward, heals his eyesight, but also heals his faith. I think of the executioner at the cross, how Jesus healed his sight, not in a physical sense, but he went from executing Jesus to proclaiming, surely this was the Son of God. He gained clear sight. These are the words of, of Jesus. This is his mission, and he fulfilled that mission. And the third thing I wanted to share with you is this, is that these words are so important because these are still the mission of Jesus. This is still what Jesus is doing. Jesus is alive, and he's going about, and he continues to fulfill this mission. He's bringing good news to the poor. I think of my good friend Kevin, who, who, who went after everything in order to find pleasure, everything, and it never brought him any satisfaction, so much so that every evening he, he considered ending his life. But then one, one of my friends shared the gospel with him and says, you know what, Kevin, you don't have to run after these other things. That's not where life is found. Run to Jesus. This is where life is found. This is where fulfillment is found. This is where satisfaction is found. This is where eternal life is found. This is where forgiveness is found in Jesus Christ. Kevin gave his life to Jesus, and he's a completely different person. The good news of Jesus changed his life. 
Jesus is still doing this today. Jesus is still releasing the captives. I think of my friend Donna, who, who was so held captive by her past life, by her past failures, by her past sin. She never thought that she was worthy, never thought that God could forgive her particular sin. But one day she was reading scripture, and she came across the, the, those words about how, how if you confess your sins, Jesus is faithful to forgive. And the Spirit of God just made those true in her heart and her life. And she confessed those sins. And, and it was almost like Jesus was in the room, which he was, lifting off the burden from her. Jesus is still doing this work today. I think of my friend John, who the Lord brought him sight in a, in a spiritual sense. See, John didn't believe in God at all. He'd say, there's no God. And then all of a sudden he had all this back pain. And he dealt with it for over a year, just excruciating pain. One of his friends who's a Christian said, hey, John, can I pray for you? John would have never accepted that in the past. But he said, you know what? I'm desperate. You can pray for me. And so his friend laid hands on him and just prayed in the name of Jesus that he would be healed. The next morning, John got up. And when he got up, the pain was completely gone. He called his friend and said, you got to tell me more about this Jesus. It's really hard to not believe in God when you've been healed by God. <laughs> and so this person shared about Jesus and John gave his life to Jesus. And now when you talk to John, he tells you about all the stories of how he's seeing God move in his life. It's like the Lord gave him spiritual sight. The Lord is still doing this today. Final thing I wanna share with you is this, is why are these red letter words so important? Because these words are our mission as well. They're our mission. That as people who walk with Jesus, who are empowered by the Spirit of God, these words are our mission. Our mission is to bring good news to the poor. Our mission is to release the captives. Our mission is to bring sight to the blind and, and freedom to the oppressed. Our, our mission is to go out and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor is at hand. This is our mission. And friends, I found myself over this holiday season through Thanksgiving and, and Christmas being asked this question because I, I, I met with a bunch of different people or, or I encountered a lot of people who I know from my past, but I haven't seen them in a long time. And so oftentimes when you haven't seen somebody in a long time, they ask you this question, hey, what's happening? What's new? And, and I answered the question this way, and, and I regret answering it, but maybe you've answered the question this way as well. I said, hey, not much. I got to tell you, I said that so many times as, as people ask me that through this season, hey, what's new? Ah, oh, not much. That I became disgusted with the answer. And so I forbid it out of my vocabulary when that question's asked. You see, I want in the future when somebody asks that, my, that question of me, they know they have to have at least an hour or two on their hands. Okay? Hey, what's going on? What's new? I don't want to be a not much Christian. I want to be a so much Christian. Are we a not much church? No. We're a so much church. What's going on? So much. Sit down. Grab that coffee. I got some things to tell you. So much is going on. The Lord is releasing captives. The Lord is bringing sight to the blind. Jesus is, is releasing prisoners. Man, the, the, the years of the Lord's favor is at hand. I'm seeing God move all over the place. So much is going on. This is our God. He's doing so much. So how do these red letter words become our mission? A couple quick things. First, we need to ask for the filling of the Spirit. Uh, without the Spirit, it becomes our mission, not the Lord's mission. And we need this filling of the Spirit. Lord, fill me with, with your presence, with your Spirit, so that I can walk in, in, in your kingdom. The second thing, through intentionality. You know, I'm a person that writes lists. Any other list makers in the room? Yeah, it's a good thing. But oftentimes, I write my list. Here's what I need to do. Here's what I need to accomplish. I think with intentionality this year, we need to wake up early and say, Lord, What's on your list for me today? Um, what are you calling me to do? Fill me with your spirit now, Lord. What do you want to do in and through me? Third thing, how do we make this our mission? Through radical obedience. All right, the Lord's filled me with his spirit. He's given me some, some plans for the day. Now I'm going to obey those things and see what he might do. Lord's friends, I, um, I, I want this to be a moment where we really fix our eyes on Jesus. I want these four months to be 
months where we, we grow in exponential ways in our relationship with Jesus. But that takes a commitment from us to turn our eyes to him. As I was preparing this message, a song came to my heart uh, that I want to share with you. It's called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And this is a song actually early on. I'm not sure why I did this, but I started singing it to our girls when they were infants. Occasionally, I still sing it to them today. And the words are this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I wonder if we might sing that song together. Right now, no instruments, just our voices. As a time early in this year, this 2020 year, to say to the Lord, Lord, we're turning our eyes to you, Jesus. We can run and chase after a lot of things, but Lord, we're gonna chase and run after you. We turn our eyes to you, Jesus. I wonder if, if, you, if you want to, would you sing this song with me? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace